One of the weirdest things I think about people is most people don't know like what they're actually good at. So it's like you don't know like what is your superpower if you have one superpower、um, and how can you like, can you articulate that? And most people actually can't, which is unfortunate because I feel like if most people could just like spend a day like thinking about that, they would be so much more successful in, in different parts of their career. Hi Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey Grace, thanks for having me. Been looking forward to this, so let's、uh, uh, let's have a fun time together. Totally. So you grab in Melo Park, and then you know, as an early user of AOL, you have collected like sports memorabilia cards, and then you are basically a early deal maker <laughs> in that space. So like, and then like fast forward to today, you started your own VC fund. Before that, I've heard just like so many like I feel like a lot of your story are like super inspiring. You have like you know sent letters. To Bill Gates and like athletes, and then you have like offered two months salary to a startup to join them, and then、uh, you know now you're running your own fund, and then you guys have like multiple funds. You grew from like a solo GP to now like managing a multiple people fund. It's like quite an impressive story. And so today, like I would love to like you know hear you know to start of the show, I would love to hear like you know your perspective on like what are, what is like one experience that kind of like changed your life early on in your career that kind of like shaped you into who you are today. Yeah, I think a lot of the things you mentioned just came from being an early adopter on the internet. So whether it was Prodigy or AOL,、um, in high school we hung out in chat rooms on AOL, and there were. Marketplaces that existed within these chat rooms, and so you become friends with screen names, really like individual dealers with screen names, and you you build trust with them. So you do smaller transactions. So you'd send somebody like a signed basketball, and they'd return it to you. And you you kind of like build trust with strangers on the internet、um, and do commerce with them. And you know, I, I spent most of my free time after school doing this. And I went downstairs because we now have a, a memorabilia room in my house and. You mentioned the Bill Gates photo. It's kind of funny to look back on who we also spent a lot of time just writing letters to people. So there were databases of office addresses or home addresses, and so、um, and next to the addresses, they normally say who who responded and what they would、mm-hmm. send in return if you wrote them a letter. So we had a pretty good idea of like who would respond. But I think what it taught me really was is like you don't like you never know who's going to respond to that email or letter, and you definitely won't. Figure it out unless you send the note, and so it's kind of taken me to venture capital now. Where honestly, like a huge part of our job is to send to send outbound emails to strangers and hope that they respond. And so whether it's、um, whether it's founders, like like I'm proud proudest of the fact that a lot of our best investments have just been we find some founder on the internet, maybe they write. A paper, or we just discover their product, and, and you just send them a, a really thoughtful Twitter DM or email, and and you know I think the one thing I learned was that you have to put thought into that out, that outreach, and so it's definitely not like a spray and pray approach. It's、mm-hmm. the more work you put into that,、um, the better results you have. But all those moments kind of made me less afraid of of reaching out to people, and it's really. Helped me in my career. Yeah, totally. So I'm curious. Wait, so like you sent Bill Gates letter to get something so you can sell, or like what was that? Like what was that for? Yeah. So there were two different things. One was we were sending, we were trading memorabilia in, in these chat、mm-hmm. rooms, but the other one was just you just send, you'd write it a handwritten letter and you'd send it to to celebrities or athletes or、um, influencers, and and they would, if you and you'd always ask them for, like I, I'd ask for like, hey, can you respond with a signed photo? I'd usually send a what they call a, a self-address stamp envelope, which was、mm-hmm. you would you would write out your home address and and、mm-hmm. and and put a stamp on it. So it's like again, just like removing all friction to them, putting something in an envelope and putting it in their mailbox, so they don't have to worry about finding a stamp. And so I know these like very basic things, but you the conversion on the、uh, notes went up the easier you made it. For them, and so, so in the case of, of of like Bill Gates, and a good one was was Michael Jordan sent me a signed jersey, and that was I, I saw him at a hotel once, and I I went up to his wife at the time and said, I know Michael doesn't want to sign an autograph because he's on vacation, but if I sent you a letter, would would he would he send me an autograph if I sent him a letter? And she said she told me that that he would and sent and gave me their address. So、um, again, like it's like empathizing with, with people. <laughs> 
because everybody was everybody was was running up to him and asking for his autograph and nobody like nobody was getting the autograph so it's just how do you like get somebody to want to do something for you like do a favor for you and anyway th those were fun times but i think that um the internet was very different back then obviously you had AOL and now like that activity would probably be on your phone and it would probably be like a verticalized marketplace or a verticalized social experience. It was just in some ways like the internet was just really a lot more fun back then because it was kind of anything went. And so I, you, you kind of, you kind of grew up learning. Like a lot of people were like, they used to were like internet native, you know, I definitely like am internet native in, in, in many ways. And probably a lot of it was because I grew up in um, the Bay area and had a lot of friends who's, parents worked in the industry and um, was just kind of always around technology in, in, in different ways. I think I heard that your father works in real estate instead of like, you know, in tech. And then like you, I don't know if you have like any like kind of mentors early on or like, is there like, do you have like a personal board of advisors whenever you pivot your career that you could like go for the advice? Um, I definitely did not back then. I'm lucky I have a huge family. So I have, I'm one of eight, eight kids. And so between my board of directors is like my brothers and sisters who know me better than anybody else. As I've gotten older in my career, I've had a lot of people help me out. And so I was always like really afraid to ask people to be my mentor. And I still think I've never asked anybody, will you be my mentor? But it just so happened that a lot of people have taken interest in my career at different points. So I've been lucky. Um, but the group of mentors are largely older VCs who, even if I call them a mentor on this podcasts and they heard it they probably wouldn't realize that i consider them to be a mentor but um so it's people like like mike maples at floodgate has been really generous with his time over the years um a lot of the benchmark partners so bill gurley's been really helpful to me we haven't we don't meet like every quarter but when we have met um it's been really helpful um and then honestly a lot of people who i've been able to work with in my career so um, I was in, I was an early employee at Tinder, and I remain close with Sean Rad, who is the founder and CEO over there. And we are friends. We talk about all sorts of things, but so he's not a mentor, but he's definitely influential in my um, a lot of parts of my my career. That again, he wouldn't know it know that because I've never like properly told him that. But um, but there's just people who you collaborate with and develop a bond with and go to, especially in harder moments of your of careers because as we've all seen in in the past year year or two like everything investing isn't easy and so um i've really relied especially in the bear market on a lot of mentors for different support i'm curious like later on how do you kind of build up these you mentioned like you wouldn't meet up bill Gurley for like quarterly or something like um, how do you kind of like maintain these type of relationships to, like going forward after, you know, let's say we met at dinner and then like after that, like how do you follow up with people or how do they follow up with you to kind of like keep the relationship going? Big part of it is um, just like the line of work we're in, it ends up being highly collaborative. And so there's so many reasons to reach out to people throughout the course of one business day it's whether you you're seeing an interesting investment opportunity whether you you know uh whether a company you're you're you've invested in previously is looking to fundraise like there's within the industry it's really easy to reach out as long as you have interesting things to share with people i feel like the biggest biggest thing that people do wrong when trying to network um or keep in touch with people is to just like send like the hey do you have time i want to pick your brain type of email and <laughs> like everybody's just too busy and so you have to not that every interaction needs to be like transactional but like there needs to be a real purpose to why you want to catch up with somebody unless you're just like real life friends like we all have friends who we just like would go on a walk with or do things with because you just want to see them and um, but for most people that are busy that's not the case and so i think it's knowing um the right context and timing and then i've tried to develop personal crms and it just like never really works unfortunately <laughs> uh, but aspirationally like there would be better ways to do this it's just i've never really built a, uh, a great system to productize the art of keeping in touch with people what is like one skill that you're constantly trying to get better at the soft skill would just be like decisiveness and candor and honesty i think i've especially as I've gotten older, just I'm a, like I try and please, I'm a people pleaser. And I've realized that about myself over time. And sometimes that comes at the expense of not being direct enough. 
And so, um, especially now managing a team uh, where we're a thousand decisions to make every day, the decisiveness is so important to running a business. And so, um, and honesty, really. So if an employee is not performing up to expectations and that's hurting the team, like being really clear with with those people and doing it very proactively. So um, it's, it's something I think uncomfortable conversations are really hard for most people to have and it doesn't come naturally to me. And so, I've, but I found the more uncomfortable conversations I've, ha- I've I've experienced, like the easier it becomes. And so that's probably like the soft skill on, um, I think the hard, the hard school is just like there's to stay relevant in tech you need to continuously level up your technical skills which Mm. is pretty obvious but you and it's not like coding um that level of technical skills it's staying current with whatever like the next trend might be or mega trend might be and that's hard to do repeatedly like that requires a lot of work um and so whether it's you know staying up web through and crypto or one vertical but then you look at now obviously ai is a huge conversation and to be really proficient and have a strong point of view on any part of the ecosystem is really hard to do. And so that's probably the hardest thing is just like maintaining the curiosity and creating enough time to to constantly be learning. When you are diving into a specific subject, like what are some ways that you kind of educate yourself and what are some actions that you took to kind of like quickly become an expert? Yeah, I think there's a person type that just becomes obsessed with whatever they do. So if you think about um, like what what does it take to become an expert in any subject, it requires very simply like hours. And so you 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 have to like the amount of work you have to do is is intense. Like it's intense to and so it's a lot of reading and research. And then a huge part of it is you need you know like guides. So you, whenever I go to a new field or a new part of any industry, like you find a couple people who are willing to to kind of like show you the ropes, like and introduce you to the right people. And I definitely had that in crypto early on. Um, I had a few people who were really generous with in- introductions, but also just like, hey, like here's a different perspective and here's a part of the ecosystem I think you're missing. Again, these can be mentor- mentors. I think the word mentor, I think a lot of people associate that with like someone who's old and mm-hmm. wise and Sometimes mentors can be younger than you too. Like they can mm-hmm. be twenty-two year old who is just graduating from some CS department, and <laughs> I find like a lot of my mentors end up being younger than me too, which is a, a weird thing. You have to have a lot of a certain level of like humility to to be willing to admit that someone who's just graduating college is capable of mentoring you. Um, <laughs> and I I don't um, I don't have a problem with with saying that and. I often find one reason I like crypto, and again, this is lost on like the current narrative of crypto is I consistently feel so out of my league in in rooms, Um, like intellectually out of my league where I'm like the level of conversation and and whether it's talk about um, like like the macroeconomic environment or technical topics, really, it's really humbling to be in in those in those conversations and not uh, feel like you're like the dumbest person in the room. And so, but I think that's part of what makes uh, makes certain people good at, at investing is just like the willingness to to be the, the the least smart person in any room and to pick up on different signals um, in conversations that lead you to different areas that you should be studying or, or getting better at. You know, like I feel like you have came through like so many different stages in your career. At the beginning, it was like you worked in like film and TV and then you re- recognize there's like absolutely no, not no potential, but like it, it's something that you personally don't want to do. And then later yeah. on, like you've been like working in products, like you work at a startup in Kansas City, join Tinder to grow it into, you know, from like number 17 app to like number one app and like grow their revenue side and stuff like that. And then now you're growing your own fund when you first started in investing you were it was probably before tinder at that point you were like just spending like a couple thousand dollar on like angelis to invest in these companies and then to now you are i think this is your third fund correct me if i'm wrong it's like 60 million how did you grow from like a guy who like dropped like a couple thousand dollar on angelis <laughs> to now what are some different stages that you have to went through to like get there the stages are not all just quickly lay them out was I was investing in other people's syndicates on AngelList and then I ended up um, becoming a scout for Index Ventures. So that was another step. That was a long, at the same time, I, I built my own syndicate on AngelList. So I was able to to create SPVs on a deal by deal basis. But those were all, by the time I started 
fun one, I had already invested in probably 30 or 40 companies. And so mm -hmm. it made a ton of mistakes um, is the real truth, like the over years. So I'd seen, I'd not only made the mistakes, I was able to see the mistakes <laughs> uh, to some like conclusion. And so what it, you know, I think investing is, it's really hard to to learn without 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 making investments and, and seeing the life cycle of a few companies. I but I raised fund one in 2019 and it was a small again it was a small fund by like venture fund standards it was around 10 million dollars which um, to me at the time felt like a huge fund. I was like I can't mm -hmm. believe the reason I mentioned that is because I see a lot of people raise go to raise their first fund never really invested before and they want to raise you know, 30, $40 million funds. And some people can pull it off and succeed. But for the most, most people, I kind of think that's a really bad idea because um, you ultimately have probably two to three funds to really prove your, your thesis and, and your investing abilities. And if you go raise the big fund right away, your odds are you, you probably are, are not going to, to, to succeed if you, as if you'd kind of like stage it out. But the reality is, I think, it's, it's taken me, I think I'm in year, around year 10 of being an, an investor and I still make a ton of mistakes. And the reality is I'm still learning and still feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting started. So, um, so for anyone who is actually just getting started, I would say like, be patient and start small and don't feel pressure to, to raise a, a huge fund. Like just try to become a scout at a venture fund. That's always a good way to do things. Um, and, or try to invest small amounts of money in your friends um, or interesting projects because those people are often will let you invest a couple thousand dollars in their projects and, and that's a good place to get started. I'm curious, like, number one is like, how do you get into the hot deal? Like, how do you kind of position yourself as like someone who could add value? I think maybe that question will lead to like a second sub question, which is like, you have a really robust presence on Twitter. And then how have you been like, like building up that presence? And then like, how does that influence your like investing career? Yeah, definitely. I think the, um, the Twitter Tinder. And so um, at the time, I was leading revenue products at Tinder, and we were building, we built the top grossing app in, in the world um, on the App Store and Play Store. And so people took an interest in what I was saying because it was so specific. It was like, hey, Tinder is killing it in terms of monetization. And like the person who's leading monetization is tweeting about different things they're doing. So of course, like I'll follow him because most founders care about monetization. <laughs> like you want to, uh, you want to, you want to learn different insights around um, how how to build revenue generating businesses. So people were, were curious about that. Um, I think I've book it it kind of all happened by accident. I've actually I think in many ways like need to spend more time on on Twitter and re-engage with that part because once you once you build an audience, I think the rally is also that you're less likely to say interesting things because there's more risk in saying those in saying those things. Um, and especially on Twitter right now, I think there's just a general lack of compassion, empathy for people, really. And so um, mm -hmm. it's made me like a little bit more. I would say it's like it's like created um, a different style of of a Twitter account that's less to me like less interesting. But hopefully, I'll be able to get back to be more interesting on Twitter. The um, the hot deals question, I think, is if you're just trying to be an angel in a company, there's and you're talking to a founder, there's like a very simple process they go through to determine who gets in their round. They're basically creating a advisory board through their cap table of different subject matter experts who they want to add to to that group of investors. And so if you're writing a 25k check, normally if you have a very specific skill that you can bring to that company and the founder wants to work with you, like you can figure things out. And so for um for someone like yourself, obviously like you can lean into the fact that you're you know, you're building a great media platform um, or a whole list of other things, but you have to know some of like your sales comment earlier, like you have to know how to sell yourself and what mm -hmm. you're uniquely good at. And so I was able to position myself as like the product focus growth monetization person that you could add to your cap table. And for most people, especially kind of as Tinder was ascending through the revenue charts, like they found that to be helpful. And so I've kind of been able to, to build that into a longer term investing career. But the and then in crypto, I think the pitch is pretty clear, like crypto needs better 
products because most of the UX and UI is pretty bad. Um, and so, so that was always a, a pretty clear reason why people would want to work with me. But, but yeah, I think you have to know how to position yourself and have confidence. Um, one of the weirdest things I think about people is most people don't know like what they're actually good at. So it's like, you don't know, like, what is your superpower if you have one superpower um, and how can you, like, can you articulate that? And most people actually can't, which is unfortunate because I feel like if most people could just like spend a day, like thinking about that, they would be so much more successful in, in different parts of their career. How do you kind of like after you meet someone and then like kind of like show yourself like as a really impressive person to like asking them to give you money? I think it's hard. Like asking people for money is uncomfortable. And so I've always found like the best way to fundraise is to not ask people for money um, and to let them kind of bring them along for different parts of your journey. Get to the point where when you're going to fundraise, they know you well enough where they're excited to invest in you because they believe in you. But that takes time to to develop. And so um, in the case of Sequoia, like the partner who I, I who kind of championed um, chapter one at Sequoia, I'd known for many years. And so it was a very easy conversation. And um, uh, similar with, with kind of Chris Dix and Mark Andreessen, like I'd, I think we had known each other at different points of our career um, and they were able to, to, they kind of knew my, me as a person before they invested. And so, so yeah, I think, I think it's like developing take a more long-term approach to fundraising and definitely not asking people for money like in the first interaction it's it it really requires so if, if you're a fund manager like creating a, a a friends list that you you email those friends when you have lp updates so they see your progress and you keep them updated um and when you raise your next fund maybe they're really interested to participate but it's it's definitely um it's a hard thing I, I'll, I'll never fully get used to like having to ask people for money. It's like the part of being a venture capitalist and running a fund that um, people don't talk about a lot is you have to be fundraising almost always um, in addition to investing. That's a hard, it's a hard skill that doesn't necessarily come natural naturally to, um, to a lot of people. I believe it was your first fund. You guys have like 300 LPs and there, there were some like big tech executives and stuff like that would invest with you. How did they heard about you? Was that like from Twitter? And like when you mentioned about building these relationships, like is there like any specific things that you do to like keep them updated? Because I think if I were like building really deep personal relationship with 300 people, I would die. Yeah, when I was getting started, there, was no, there were no shortcuts. Like I had to talk to every investor on Zoom and pitch them on on what we're doing. It was I've I've easily done probably over a thousand pitches. Like you you're constantly pitching. Standing so that's easy like that's easy. Like you can schedule five pitches a day and over the course of six months maybe you talk to a couple hundred people. Um I think the harder part as you mentioned is staying in touch and candidly like that's not something I've done well in all cases. The creating a cadence and this is important for founders too where you're you stick to so every every month on the first day of the month you send your investor update and people feel like you're constantly in their inbox in a friendly way um keeping them updated on on what's going on a big mistake i see with founders specifically is you don't hear from them for six months or 12 months then then they they need to fundraise again and and that's when you hear from them and and nobody wants to be thought of as being like a bank or yeah. or just a financial partner. Like people really want to, especially when they're taking a chance on you in your in your career. Like they want to feel like they're a part of the journey. And so that's um, again, I think it's it's creating that 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 kind of like cadence. Then there are different systems you can build. There's um, a really good CRM I use. It's called Clay, which is is helpful. Clay Earth is the domain. Do you have Airtable? an Airtable database where I can filter by location. So if you're going to New York or the Bay Area or mm-hmm. Europe, like you're thinking of those people when you before you go on the trip. Um, and so you create you create ways to keep in touch through travel as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think you have to be really proactive about about reaching out, especially in this environment. Like people people are actually looking for ways to not deploy capital right now, whether it's VCs or LPs, um, limited partners. And so the bar for having people invest in your company or your fund is much higher than it was a year or two ago. And so the, again, like if you were to think about not like natural human behavior is you want to do business with people you like, people who you trust, people who are your friends. And the only way to do that effectively is to have develop a really natural relationship and friendship with, with people. Um, but it takes a lot of time and work and 
it's definitely not something I'm perfect at. Um, it's, it's, it's something you have to, to kind of like practice every day. So first of all, like, I think I'm really curious, like, how do you always know, like, what you should do for each of your steps? Because I think you, you've done so many, like, really crazy things. Like, for example, when you pivot into a product, you would not taking salary for, like, two months or something. You wrote in your cover letter to be like, hey, I'll just give you two months of my salary. And then, like, move to Kansas City within, like, 24 hours or something <laughs> like that. You know, you, you know, you know when to start Twitter, like when you were at Tinder and then you were t- tweeting about these things. And then now even starting the fund, I feel like you're just basically one of the pioneers of these like solo GP era. How do you kind of like learn what to do? And like for venture, like I feel like before you or like people in your era, like I feel like it's very hard to think about like someone would like just start like a solo GP fund because like in the traditional it's like getting a job in venture and then like having these like investing experience and blah 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 blah. How do you basically pioneer like creating this kind of like process for yourself? Yeah, I think the again, like everything's been very incremental. So it hasn't felt like these huge like big decisions that I've had to make along the way. The way I kind of do things generally is I I like to plan, but I don't like to overthink. And so um, I'll plan, like the idea of starting the first fund, created the deck, like emailed the people who were backing me on Angelus in SPV and had maybe the deck took me a week to create and the email took me a couple hours to write, but um, was able to raise my first small amount of capital basically in a week. And so the key is just getting getting started, like jumping out of the plane while it's moving type of thing. Like you have to like, you have to, you really have to, to just like put yourself out there. And I've always found a really easy way to get started on projects is to announce those projects on, on Twitter before I do any amount of work and see if people are interested. So if you say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to work on this project and get a really strong response from people, then it it's motivating to actually do the project. And so I'd like to like, do you think of, of, of like building MVP? A lot of that can come, can be helpful in your personal work. And so if you think of something you want to pursue, you, you, you email, you have a, maybe, you, maybe you already have a sub stack following and you email your newsletter and say, Hey, like, we're going to start working on this. It's, it's really motivating to do. And so I've always found like that accountability to be, to be important. The other part I think too, is just realizing that you can do it. I think is for some reason, when I was younger, um, I always thought like being a venture cop, copless, like required permission um, mm-hmm. from like, some gatekeeper or someone who is like going to say, Hey, yeah, like you're, you can do this. Um, it's just like any other form of entrepreneurship. Like you, if you have enough grit and like hustle, you can probably go get started in some way. And so you might not be able to raise your first fund, but maybe you, as I mentioned there, maybe you can become a scout at a venture fund. Maybe you can start to, 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 to convince friends to let you on their cap tables, like whatever, but that's just one, like investing is just one part of this. And mm-hmm. I know not everyone, who's listening to this wants to be an investor because being an investor is fun, but it's not the only thing to do in in the world. It really applies to whatever you want to do. Um, You you really have to like believe in yourself and believe that you're worthy of whatever your ambition is. And then once you give yourself permission to do that thing, mapping out the most logical steps to to getting started and then really kind of like put yourself out there and and do it. When you're starting investing, like you are investing in like, smaller checks and like even it's smaller checks but like out of your own pocket like each month if you're investing like 5k into something that's like still like a substantial amount of money when if you were like early on in your career and i'm curious like back in time like how do you financially make this viable because if you invest in like 40 deals that's like even the smallest model check that's like 40k or something yeah i think what you mentioned is really important to know which is the time horizon on early stage private investments is so long it's Mm -hmm. unbelievable that it normally takes 10 to 15 years to see liquidity and so that to lock your any amount of capital in in anything for 10 to 15 years is a commitment and so i would um one mistake i made i think early on was i wrote too big of checks into too few companies so i think my first two investments were fifteen thousand dollars each which again like at the time i did not have like i should not have been writing that size investments because i didn't have a ton of capital to like personal money to invest in projects. And so I would say try and do smaller checks. I'd say also the, again, this is not investment advice, but like the asset classes that are more liquid. So um, whether it's public markets or digital assets to crypto, again, like 
crypto is very volatile, so proceed with caution. But the benefit there is you have liquidity. So if you were to see a return um, or see a, a company appreciate, you can you can trade out that position at, at any time as a private investor, as opposed to if you invest in an equity position in early stage startup in traditional SaaS or venture, it takes a long time. Yeah, I would say I'd say the um, the path is not easy. And if you don't have personal capital to invest as an angel, it's even harder. And I, I empathize with that a lot. Like it's very hard. The best thing you can do, I think, is whatever you think you can afford to do, like start building a portfolio. So whether it's Robin, like a Robin Hood account, maybe you set aside a thousand dollars and say, I'm going to find 10 positions and build a portfolio that I can explain. So when I'm going to raise a fund or going to land a, a job or an internship, I manage a portfolio. It doesn't need to be the dollar amount's not important. It's the quality of decision making that's important. So I've even seen, um, if you know Turner Novak, he's Twitter influencer, but also an investor and a friend. Um, he just he would every every year release a fantasy portfolio of private companies to startups. And that really captured a lot of people's attention because he he wasn't investing his own money, but he was showing performance, the implied performance, had he actually made the investments. Yeah. And so um, you can do things like that, or you can write a newsletter and talk about your favorite companies in, in, in depth. And, and again, like these are all ways to get an audience and build trust with people that you are a high quality thinker and um, that you might be a good investor one day, because that's really what you're trying to, to prove to the market, but also yourself that you could be a good investor. And so those are different ways. How did your investment thesis shift from like deal sourcing to evaluating in that company? Can you maybe like walk us through like a company that you've done that you feel like were demonstrating your like investment logic and stuff like that? The things we evaluate are three things. One is product within product distribution plays a, a big part. So um, product and distribution. The second is 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 market. And the third is team. And so those three areas, I think, are um, we could have like individual podcasts in each one. I think the, the one part that I've underestimated that's been probably the biggest part of my just performance has been market. And so really, I haven't appreciated this as much until recently, but team is critical. Building in a great market, a growing market is is probably the most important thing, I think, for an early stage startup. And so I've seen this with my early bets in in crypto. Um, so we, I was an angel investor in Dapper Labs, Compound Finance, and the Graph, which are all great. You, you'd look at that portfolio and say, wow, you're um, a great investor. The performance on those companies in 2018, when the crypto markets weren't um, hot, was those companies, I, I, I just thought they were frankly, not going to work. And so, but then the markets picked up in, um, in, in 2020 and 21, and suddenly I look really smart. And so the same founding team, better market. But I think, I think it's really hard to internalize this because the best companies create new markets often. And so, but creating new market is, is harder than innovating or iterating within an existing big market. But that's been the hardest lesson is like, I, I want to invest in the best tactical founders I meet, but often like the market's just not there. And so, and then I come from a product background. So I always like, my like heart wants me to believe that the best product will win, but that's just not the case, which is why <laughs> I, I added distribution is being, is such an important part of, of product. And they're in many ways, the same, they're, in many ways, they're the same thing is, is you need product like growth. You need, um, to figure out distribution channels that allow you to reach huge audiences. And often, more often than not, you need distribution that allows you to beat an incumbent who has massive distribution. So if you're a startup, how are you going to beat Google or Facebook or Amazon or Microsoft? It's really hard. Um, so so those are different things that we look at. In terms of like picking something before their trend, what are something that you would do to like jump before the trend? And in terms of like the trend, like this year it's AI, obviously. And then next year, I don't know, yeah. like maybe like two years later, it will be crypto again. But how do you navigate the trend? Do you just invest in people that are like building whatever based on this trend because they are easier to raise the next round? And like, how do you pick the winner each year? We've um, gone back and forth on this. The Our current focus has been a mix of, of what we call the new internet, but it's largely crypto and Web3. And so the, that might change over time because again, like we think the internet is going to keep 
evolving, but the um, we think picking a lane in this market, really becoming a subject matter expert is is valuable for not only sourcing, because that's top of the funnel, but for, for winning deals as a lead investor, you really need to have expertise within the space you're investing in. And so if I were to say, hey, I'm, like we're going to go invest in a self-driving company or we're going to invest in a, a biotech company, like odds are we'd have, there'd be like terrible selection bias because we, um, like, why would we be the investors who would be able to pick the best company in that space and win? And so we've, we've focused a lot. Hardest part about focusing on specific verticals, as you mentioned, is you might be wrong. And so like we could be entirely wrong that crypto and Web3 might all be the wrong idea of what the future of the internet might become or what parts of the internet might become. And we we could miss mega trends like AI. And so we are we try to be flexible in how we approach investing to the point where we can admit when we're wrong about different mega trends and um, hopefully become smart enough about the next things. We could be wrong about crypto for the next two or three years, but at some point, like the market will come back and there's just too many smart people and builders creating different products and applications and infrastructure in the category. Like, And so if you leave the category during a, a bear market like we're in right now, it's really reputationally hard to come back. And so you need to, and it should be like, you shouldn't just jump from trend to trend. Like you need to have conviction. The hard, the hard part is is just like surviving bear markets, convincing your limited partners and investors that your intuition about a category will be correct over time, and and staying focused on on the long term purpose of what you're investing in is is really hard in a bear market. So that's the challenge we're everyone in 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 web three and crypto are facing right now, and and it's a. Uh, definitely a, a fun challenge to try and try and overcome i guess like one last like real question is like after you've becoming a solo gp now you have like a team of back in time was like over eight people i think now i saw on linkedin there's more people as <laughs> you guys so um i don't know how big is your team now but like how do you shifting into building a team and then like oh, when you're building a team since like you started your personal unfair advantages your product expertise and how do you kind of like shape that or like infuse that into your team now we're seven folks now we have a college research program i think a lot of them put chapter one on their linkedin so <laughs> if you search linkedin you'd think we were like andreessen horowitz but we're a much smaller team um the dna we've tried to create is one that looks like a software company so a lot of engineers product people data science um and the idea which we're proving out is that if you have a full stack team of investors who, have, who are former operators with tech, largely technical backgrounds, um, that product as a built as a product that will be really attractive to founders and potentially more appealing than what a traditional venture fund can offer. And so if you think about traditional investors who maybe came from, I don't know, like iBanking or private equity, like we think, we think founder preference is such that they really want to work with people who have built products that they admire. And so we we created a team. Our team right now is former Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Andreessen Horowitz and Tinder with myself. And we think those life experiences also kind of a funny part of it is we're we do invest largely in crypto and web three, but we come from these big monolithic web two companies, which I think makes us like actually different as a venture fund in the space, but potentially less cool to some people, like which we're okay with. Um, because it's like you guys didn't grow up only doing crypto, but we grew up building products for billions of people that have like and have worked at scale. And so we think that is an is an advantage. Um, but yeah, I think that the hard the hard thing about investing is again like to the earlier conversations, it's it it takes time to learn. And so trying to I guess like develop people's careers and teach them some of the things that you've learned without while letting them make their own decisions in many cases and have the opportunity to to make some mistakes is is something that I've had to learn um, because sometimes there have been situations where maybe I'm not a strong yes on on different investments but but we end up doing a smaller check and that's to kind of let that investor have the flexibility to to learn and to prove myself or anyone anyone else wrong because I make so many mistakes every every year really. Um, like if I look back on the investment decisions I make, I make 
I make a ton of mistakes um, as well. So um, I, I want to have team members who are willing to put themselves out there and say, hey, I want to like fight for this investment. And even if you don't believe in it, um, I want to do it. And and we'll in a year or two have a conversation about whether, you know, how that decision, the the results of that decision. But um, but you need to give people a chance to to make their own decisions too, which is a big part of part of investing. I have a couple fire on questions for you. Number one is like, what's your favorite book? Catch from the Rye has been my favorite book for a long time. And that is fiction. I think probably nonfiction. There's a book called The Coach, um, Bill Campbell, who was mm. a really famous coach to Sergey Brin, Brin and Larry Page and Steve Jobs' best, best friends. And um, Bill Campbell was my football coach growing up. And so um, <laughs> I uh, I found that to be a really cool book because I didn't realize how, I just thought of him as being my football coach and I didn't realize how special he was. Um, I knew I knew he was a special person, but I didn't, I didn't realize the full extent of his his story. So it's really cool to read. So he didn't tell you all these like tech in these stories over these football sessions. <laughs> never once mentioned that he knew Steve Jobs. Never mentioned any of it i just i literally thought i was just being a football coach which that's is that's crazy <laughs> oh my god i i heard of well i have the book in my audible i believe i probably like listen to some of it and i definitely heard crazy stories but like yeah like that's insane but <laughs> a person living <laughs> double life yeah uh, pretty cool uh, yeah totally uh who would you invite to your dinner party well i'd invite you of course because we already had dinner and it was a fun time <laughs> um but no, I think on the my grandfather, who's no longer alive, but um, he started a public company called Mervin's, which became a really great uh, success story. I would probably invite on the investment side, probably like Doug Leone, I think would be really fun to have dinner with um, from Sequoia Capital. Probably just like a lot of random, interesting people who um, who have influenced my life. So there's a guy named Bo Fishback, who started the company who hired me in Kansas City. Zarley, who have, is really fun to to hear his perspective. Optimistic people, I think, is, is probably just like people who give me energy. The longer I've, like as you get older and you have less time, you are drawn to people with a lot of positive energy. People give you energy. Um, so I think that's probably probably a big part of it. Um, speaking of that, who made the biggest impact in your career? Probably my wife. I know it's like a Simone, um, because she's been here supporting me through Tinder, through chapter one. So having a really good support system at home because being a founder is really, it can be hard. Um, and there's a lot of days where I have self-doubt and she helps me get through that. And then professionally, I think, you know, I mentioned some of the people at Tinder who really, I think I loved working with, but Sean Arad is, was, was a big part of my career. We started Tinder, I think it's pretty obvious without Sean, I would never have been at Tinder because it, it would never have started, but we've also become really good friends. So he's been a big part of my career too. Uh, where can we find you also of work? At, uh, our office is on Third Street in Santa Monica. And so I love, I'm at my home office today, but um, I would say the key to living in LA is to not ever have to send traffic. And so my life is within a one mile radius. I have an office in Santa Monica. Um, I live five minutes from my office and you might find me jogging around Santa Monica. Honestly, I'm, I'm like such a boring person right now because we just had a baby so you probably won't see me anywhere except for online <laughs> <laughs> that's so sweet and like thank you so much jeff for, for taking the time to yeah. come on the podcast of course yeah thanks for having me appreciate it, grace